All right, folks. So getting started. I saw. Let's see. I walk in. So we got everybody. Uh, we uh, have had another watch party, right? So those of you that uh, were able to watch uh, I Dream of Wires, any further comments, things that you guys found interesting, things that were, I don't know, what's your impressions overall? We had a nice chat at the end. Okay. <laughs> okay. It was more so like when I was referencing all the people that like just like would stay in their basements basically. Ah, okay. <laughs> This is glorifying the people that we're not supposed to be. <laughs> okay, there is something introverted about uh, yeah your, your your basement modular synth studio. Uh, what else? Any other things? Well, I thought it was interesting how they're like kind of like uh, there's like a small but like very dedicated like following mm -hmm. of people that want to kind of like go back to some of like the structural design of, like I guess the vintage synths. Mm, yeah. Um, so that was really interesting and really cool to see that happening because I kind of like got the frustration with like the DX7 and stuff. Ah, uh, okay. Like, change people's perspectives on like making sound and kind of like going backwards, like more, like, <coughs> classical element rather than like creating new sounds based on like timbre. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a rich, <coughs> retro element to what's going on with Eurorax and analog synthesizers right now, um, but it's it's interesting to see it happen, right? Um, I mean, everything you can do with those that Eurorack, those Eurorack modules, you can do inside of Max. Um, but there's something about the tactile, having the thing basically in your hands, right, uh, that you miss in a software virtual environment. Uh, remind me, I was trying to remember over the weekend if um, Don Buchlo was featured in it at all, or was he mentioned? <laughs> Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For, for that's the West Coast philosophy. Yeah, West Coast philosophy, right? Okay. And did you see the news on Friday that uh, Don yeah. Buchla actually passed away? Uh, so we've lost uh, another one of the great synth pioneers. Basically, Moog was kind of East Coast philosophy, uh, which he passed a couple years ago, um, and then Buchla passed just on Friday, basically. Um, I don't know. The, I think the guys at EMS would be kind of the other camp. Uh, one of them is still going, still making um, synthes, uh, but there's like a really long waiting list, as, as we've talked about before, for a, a new one. Um, but yeah, I think this is, uh, we're kind of in an interesting period where a lot of these pioneers are kind of at the age where we're, we're losing some of them each year, basically. So uh, I think it's good to to know who those pioneers are, and then if you find an opportunity to, to have a chance to see or hear one of them speak, okay, uh, do take that opportunity because uh, it's uh, we're, we're we're in that era where they're I think each year we're we're losing somebody basically from that from that era, okay. Um, so I just want to make a note of that. Um, so thanks. Yeah, the offer still stands. I think think we're it's through this Friday because I said two weeks, right? So through this Friday, if you organize a watch party. Um, and again, the, the purpose of the watch party is to have a discussion afterwards. So I'm glad you guys were able to look, look at the movie, watch the movie, and then talk a little bit afterwards. Um, and it doesn't have to be in your dorm room, as you can see. You can commandeer a classroom and uh, uh, put it up on the big screen, right? Uh, is that that's what we're watching here? Yes. Okay. So putting pressure 112 to good use, right? Okay. Um, all right. So. Uh, so uh, you may have noticed, and I got an email from Anthony on, I don't see him here yet, okay, uh, yesterday that uh, there is not a reading response due for today. That's because today's chapter was actually assigned in two parts. So your assignment for today was to start chapter five. Um, next week, next Monday's assignment is to finish chapter five. Uh, I spent a good amount of time yesterday afternoon setting up all the remaining reading responses. So if you did finish the, uh, chapter five, you can actually uh, click into next week's folder and go ahead and finish the reading response so you don't have to worry about it next week. So you could do that. Um, but do know that you have two weeks and I wanted to kind of cover it in two parts because this chapter, although it's not too much longer than some of the other chapters, it's really dense in the number of things that it covers. Uh, and so I wanted to break it up in terms of looking at different parts of it. Um, so that's why we're doing this, uh, this particular chapter in parts, okay? Uh, so the topic, the, the chapter title heading was pop rock. So why did I start playing uh, what I was playing at the beginning of class? Because Depression was awesome. Because Depression was awesome, okay. Yes? 
So Depeche Mode is awesome, but why would they fit in with pop and rock? Particularly early <laughs> Depeche Mode, their first album before they got kind of dark and serious. What else? Yeah, yeah. Really like defined a genre as what we now call 80s synth pop. Yeah, anybody else? I mean, first off, I mean, you guys know Depeche Mode, yes? You've heard the name if you haven't listened to the music? Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's one of the earliest examples where it's completely digital synthesis across the track. Everything from percussion to lead instrument is all a digital synthesizer making the, making the sounds, basically. That's, part of, that's one of my reasons for drawing them in as a kind of first example today uh, to connect what we've been doing the last couple of weeks with modulation synthesis, right, uh, to, 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 uh, to this pop rock mindset, basically. Uh, the idea that you can create everything from your bass drum, your kick drum sound to your hi-hat to your lead synth all out of one synthesizer. That was the promise of digital synthesis, the DX7, right, in the 1980s, basically, okay. Uh, and I think I can think of no better example of that kind of coming to fruition and putting that into practice than that very first Depeche Mode album where it is from top to bottom besides the uh, voices it's all kind of it's all digital synthesis okay so uh, you can get that in your ear uh, obviously because of the time period we're not looking at a band that was using Ableton Live yes okay because right it's pre everybody understands you've got in your mind that when does Ableton Live come onto the scene Anybody know? Live 1.0? It's going to be a while ago. Yeah, you got a while to go, right? Okay. It would be late 90s, basically, is when we start seeing, when we see Live 1.0, okay? Um, so an 80s band is obviously not going to be using Ableton Live, okay? Uh, I will bring in some examples of pop rock musicians that are using Ableton Live here in the next couple of days. Uh, and I'm going to keep this trend of like starting class by playing, or starting, like, I guess, pre-class, because I hope to get it to finish playing music uh, before our, <coughs> the 9 o'clock hour starting point uh, for the class. Um, primarily, the one reason for doing that before class and before I start my recording is I don't have to worry about copyright violations on YouTube when I play it before I start my recording. Okay, so, uh, not that it's a copyright violation because now they just basically slap it with an advertisement and they start recapturing all your revenue stream. Not that I get app revenue from putting recordings of class on uh, YouTube because I think I, I would have a little bit of an ethical dilemma of posting recordings of class on YouTube and then getting even more income from teaching you guys because they already pay me to teach you guys, right? So, I don't know. You could, I don't know. Anyway. Um, so, uh, in thinking about today and what to do as an example in Ableton Live for 12 Bar Blues, uh, for, for Pop Rock, I thought that 12 Bar Blues would be a fitting example. So there's actually an, a uh, live set for you to download on Blackboard under the Class Examples folder this 19 September start of class. You can go ahead and download that if you haven't already. Uh, we're going to use that as our starting point for today and I'm going to flip over here. And once you've got it downloaded, you should see a project that looks like this. So you should see something that says, whoop, way too close. 1919 start. And so I've done a little bit of MIDI programming for you already to, at the outset so that we can get a little bit of a running start on this today. <clears throat> because I want to I want to emphasize a couple things from the reading okay one is effects processing which we've been talking about effects processing but I really really want to nail this down in terms of the routing of effects inside of live so you understand when I put an effect on a track what's the routing doing when I put an effect on a group what is the routing doing when I put an effect on a send and receive track what is it doing okay so you kind of understand that effects routing uh, but two, and two, automation, making sure that we understand what we can do with automation inside of live, both automation on the clip and automation on the track, because it's a little bit different behavior when you're on the clip versus the track, okay? Um, so, uh, I've chosen a few synths for you and programmed some clips for them. Uh, I've, everything that I've, um, let me just see, flip back to my 
everything that I've chosen today, uh, I, I've kept with the analog and the operator theme. So I've chosen presets from the analog and operator instruments that we were using last week just to kind of have some continuity. Uh, you could, as it talks about in the chapter, just as easily record in instruments and do some of the same things with audio clips rather than MIDI clips, but to have some continuity from last week, I've chosen those. We're going to be looking at uh, these effects plugins, um, the auto filter, the spectrum, and the EQ8 today, okay? Um, and if time permits, at the end, we'll look at the reverb, which the reverb is actually highlighted in the chapter, but these are, it, these are different plugins that are in the chapter that I want to highlight to kind of nail down what's going on with effects routing inside of Ableton Live, okay? Um, so, right off the bat, auto filter and EQ8, what class, you may have, if you've looked at this week and the theme for the week, what class of effects processing are we talking about this week? Automation. Well, automation, okay, automation is making the parameter of the effect move over time, okay? I'm talking about more the types of effect. Last week was all about modulation synthesis, so there's kind of a theme for today. Did anybody look ahead on the syllabus to see kind of what <coughs> the name is actually in one of these plug-in names? Filter, yeah, filtering, okay. Frequency spectrum, shaping the frequency spectrum, okay. Uh, filtering plays out in both effect processing and also you'll be reading something about uh, subtractive synthesis, which I don't know, did that come up in any of your readings so far? I don't think so. Okay, it should come up in your reading. So last week was on modulation synthesis. The synthesis technique that's related to filtering is subtraction, uh, subtractive uh, synthesis, okay? Uh, so you've already heard about additive synthesis, right? What do you think subtractive synthesis does? If additive synthesis is building up a sound with build it by building up oscillators and partials and spectra and that sort of stuff, what do you think subtractive synthesis does? Yeah? Like it takes away like some of those, like it restricts like what sound is coming out. Some of those or filters yeah, yeah. You're you're taking away. You're stripping away. Okay. So we're starting with sounds that are spectrally rich. Okay. That have really broad spectra to them, and then we're using filters to shape them over time. Okay. Uh, to shape them to the sound that we want. Okay. That's that's subtractive synthesis. When you see that terminology pop up in your readings. Uh, Okay, know that, okay, but bottom line, what we use for subtractive synthesis are filters, okay, so we're going to be looking at filters today. Uh, so let me, everybody got the set downloaded and opened up? Okay, so let's start with um, using the spectrum object. Um, I'm going to start with this noise track, and I would advise you to first turn down the volume on the noise track. So start with the noise track, turn down the volume on the, the gain slider, okay? Because if you don't, it can be kind of loud, okay? So I'm going to hit play, and I'm going to cue this uh, noise that's coming out of the analog synthesizer, okay? So we're not going to hear it because we've turned down the uh, output. But you can see here, everybody see? There's sound coming out of this analog instrument, right? Everybody's get little sliders, okay? So one useful thing about live is you get a little bit of a, uh, you get a level meter in between each object in your signal chain, okay? That's useful because you can troubleshoot really quickly. Um, if you think about signal flow, you can troubleshoot from object to object. Is sound coming out of this one? Okay. Is sound coming out of this one? Okay. And kind of move down the signal chain, okay? So I want you to go ahead over to audio effects in your uh, browser over here. Let's see here. And then scroll down and find the spectrum object. Okay. And then go ahead and drag that down to the track. Okay. So this is what analog is currently producing. Okay. And as I've labeled the track, it is noise. Okay. It should be white noise. Okay, and what do you notice about the look of white noise compared to what we've been dealing with, right? When we were doing modulation synthesis, we had a couple of clear peaks. Contrast with what you see on the screen now. How would you explain this to somebody? If you, if you didn't have the picture in front of you and you had, only, you had to use your words, as I say to my daughters sometimes. Okay, electricity zapping. Okay, that's a good metaphor. Any other? It's a spectrum of most of the frequencies between uh, 10K and 
Yeah. There's a lot of different frequencies here. Uh, there's energy at a lot of different frequencies here. And what about the pattern? I mean, is it, would we say it's stable, like the modulation synthesis? Catherine's shaking her head no. no. So if it's not stable, it's, I mean, yeah. Random. Yeah, random, right? OK. Uh, and in fact, one of the ways that you can generate white noise, as, we'll, uh, as we will see in Max, is actually by producing a new random number every sample, okay? 44,100 samples per second of random values, okay, will produce white noise, okay? Uh, and part of the reason, one of the things that people chase is like producing even better randomness because, so that it has less periodicity to it and you don't hear any kind of cycling or repeated pattern, okay? Uh, so that's how we produce white noise, and this is what it would look like on the spectrum, okay, noise, okay. Uh, if you're at all curious what this sounds like, you can kind of eke up the gain, but part of the reason I told you to turn it down is because energy at every frequency can be kind of loud, right? Those of you that maybe forgot to turn down the gain slider or didn't heed my warning, did you get a little zap of psh in your ears? Okay. Um, now, what I want to do first is kind of shape this noise using a filter, right? Okay. The noise has energy every place, so it's a really good starting point for using a filter and then starting to shape that spectra, okay? So come back up to the browser, and t somewhere near the top, you should find one that's called Auto Filter. Auto Filter is the one that we want, okay? And go ahead and drag that into your signal chain down here. No, nope. what is it going to do? It's not going to let me. Did I click wrong? There we go. Okay. So now I have a filter, and then I want you to do one more thing for me. Go ahead and click, go back down to the spectrum again and drop another spectrum after it. Because what this effectively lets you do, and this can be a good troubleshooting strategy if you're not sure what a plugin is doing, drop a spectrum on either side of it, and you can actually visualize what's going on. Okay? So we start with, bless you, the random noise, right? And we end with the other side of the filter, okay? And we have here, okay, the default setting, if you just dragged the auto filter down, is what's called a low pass filter, okay? Uh, are these terms that may have come up when you were in 161 or previous classes? Yes? Yes. Okay, what does it mean, low pass filter? What is the low pass filter? Kind of refer to what is it evoking saying yeah hunter it lets the lows pass. yes it's it's letting the low frequencies pass okay so which frequencies okay is determined by our uh, our settings here okay so you'll notice on the filter we've got a frequency knob and we've got a resonance knob okay you also have a little yellow circle here that you can grab and move and notice that the knobs are moving in tandem with me moving this yellow circle yes that tells me that these are coupled together. They're actually two different ways of controlling the same thing, okay? So if you want to just simply visually work with the speak frequency spectrum here, okay? In other words, work with the x-axis that is frequencies and the y-axis that is amplitudes, okay? Because it's, it's, it's effectively graphing the same way that your spectrogram is. You can move it graphically and you can park that yellow circle at about 1K and see that it is passing everything below 1K and it's stopping everything above 1K, okay? And in fact, filters, sometimes you talk about the pass band and the stop band, okay? So in this case, the pass band is below 1K, the stop band is above 1K, okay? The frequency then of this filter, or what's sometimes referred to as the cutoff, you'll see that terminology, the cutoff frequency is at 1K, and if I zoom back out, you should see a difference. Oh, and the, the, this is one quirk of the, let me see. Yeah, let me turn off auto. That might help us. Eh, not quite. So one effect of the, um, One kind of quirk of the spectr spectrum object is it has this auto setting where it's automatically, if, if the noise gets quieter or the sound gets quieter, it will scale down to the lower end of the amplitude range. 
Uh, and so the y-axis is constantly being recalibrated inside the spectrum object. So it might look like something is noisy, but actually it's, it's dampened down to the lower range. You can actually, if, you, if that bothers you at any point, you can actually turn off auto and then set the range here, okay? So just know that you have that capability. Um, that might help comparison-wise to make sure you're comparing apples to apples instead of apples to oranges, right? Because if you, it, everybody, I don't know, if you've uh, heard that you can, uh, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? Okay, this is kind of in that ballpark. You're, you're recalibrating the y-axis, so you might be comparing uh, negative 60 to negative 40 to negative 90 to zero, right? And that's a totally different y-axis range, right? Okay. Uh, for our purposes, I think it will work because you can see there's this slope that happens when we apply the low-pass filter, yes? And if I lower the range even further, you see how it starts to move to the left? So more or less, we can see the graph changing in coordination with the filter. Zoom in a little bit more, maybe get them both on the screen. Everybody see that? Okay, so that's a low pass filter. If we change then, we have little icons, okay? And these icon, these type of icons are very, very uh, common in uh, software synthesis and synthesizers. You, you see these little shapes drawn, which is just basically a, a, a kind of slope to this direction, a slope to the other direction, and then a, a hump, and then a, a valley, and then a, another uh, graph. And you're just supposed to know that that right there, that little icon that I've got the mouse hovering over is a low-pass filter. So if that one's a low-pass filter, and the next one, what do you think that is? High-pass filter, right? Which lets the high frequencies pass. So if you flip it this way, you'll see the graph changes, and now the noise on the high end of the frequency spectrum is going through. Okay? If that's high pass, what do you think the next one is? Band pass, yes. So if you click on that, you'll see that you get just a band of frequencies. And actually, when I did that, you could see it start to... Re Everybody see how the y-axis moves when I click on the band pass? See how it's kind of shifting up, basically? That's that recalibration, that auto calibration of the y-axis, okay? So now I'm getting just a, a band of frequencies around a center frequency as I change it, okay? Uh, the next one is a notch filter, okay? We see that dip in the frequency spectrum there, okay? So I set this up to be a really simple demonstration so you can see what these different filters do. Okay, does that make sense? Does that help you to visualize what they're doing? And it, I'm seeing some head nods. Okay, some more head nods, good, okay. Um, if you need to hear what these do, you can kind of turn up the gain, okay. But you're list, again, you're listening to broadband noise uh, and hearing it kind of overall, okay. Probably the hardest one to hear is going to be the notch filter because it's hard to hear when a frequency goes away in broadband noise. It's a little bit easier when you have uh, specific frequencies. You can actually use a notch filter to like knock out the third harmonic, if you will, or knock out a room hum that is has bleed has bled into your recording. Okay, if, uh, if there's a kind of persistent hum in your recording, that's what that's for. Okay. Um, I don't know. Any question about the f different frequency type, the different um, filter types, and the frequency spectrum that results? Because if not, I'm going to move on. Okay. So that's noise, and if I had ended there, it would have been kind of anti-musical, right? So I'm going to turn. Well, let's see. I'm going to turn this off. Or anticlimactic. Oh, there's it. recalibrating all the way down to really low level noise. Okay. So then on these other tracks, some of you may have already queued these and figured out that we have um, what I've created here is a little 12 bar <coughs> blues pattern for you. Okay. And we'll start with the pedal. Okay. So go ahead and on the glass detuned track, uh, I don't know, pick, let's, let's all pick the same key. Okay. So let's pick the F pedal. <laughs> Okay. Why would I pick 12 bar blues in a when the theme is pop rock? 
Uh, yeah, 12 bar blues is the basis of a lot of pop and rock. Okay? Who can explain what I mean when I say 12 bar blues those uh, that might not be uh, as familiar with the the theoretical basis for this how would you explain 12 bar blues to someone who just dropped in and had never taken a theory class Casey uh, it's the first chord the four two bars then the four three the key the two bars then back to one and five four four yes There's hunter it blues mm -hmm. 12 bars okay it's the basis, uh, yeah, it's the basis of a lot of blues music, okay? I saw a hand over here. Anything else to add? Okay. It's a series of chord changes that is very, very, very common in pop and rock music, okay? Also common in rhythm and blues music, okay? Um, it's... Uh, and uh, rhythm and blues is different, or R&B is different than blues, uh, strictly. Okay, so a lot of music comes out of this tradition where the twelve-bar blues is being being used to dictate the harmonic changes over time in a piece of music, and the twelve-bar blues simply repeats over and over again. Okay, which allows you to do a lot of things. You can improvise on top of these chord changes. You can. Uh, make uh, flourishes, changes, it, it, and having kind of a common harmonic change means that you can walk into a situation with musicians who you've never played with before and everybody knows the 12 bar blues changes and you can instantly lock in and start improvising together. Make sense? Okay. Um, so what I've done here is I've created a, a kind of uh, a series of patterns on top of the 12 bar blues. Okay. Um, so the dark blue is giving us the pedal point and if we were to maybe add in the auto filter I'm gonna drop that in on our track which I encourage you to do the same okay so this is a lower instrument which filter might we want to use for an instrument on the lower end of the spectrum what filter type I'm not asking about auto filter I'm asking about well for something on the lower end of the spectrum yeah, low pass filter because it's going to let the low frequencies pass, okay? So I've got the low pass filter as my default. I can dial this in and start to right hear how the timbre is changing now. Okay, until eventually we get to the bottom and nothing is happening, yes? Okay. One other thing we can do, um, I mentioned the types of filters here. Right next to it, there's this 12 and 24. Okay. Those are dB per octave. That's the, that's the slope of the curve in our low pass filter. So if I click over to 12, you notice that it's slightly less exaggerated, the slope. So if you want to let it let more of the frequencies from the stop band in, you can switch over to 12 dB per octave. Uh, that's the unit of measurement there. So 12 dB per octave. It's it's literally the slope of the line is moving down 12 dB for every octave of frequency. Okay, so where that might be a little more pleasing for. It. Okay, so you've got your auto filter. You've got your uh, low pass filter in a range where you can actually hear it affecting the timbre of it. Yes, so we're able to do that. <coughs> okay, because what I want to do now, I want to automate this filter over the course of the clip, right? So we've got 12 bars for this thing to move, right? Let's automate it over the course of that 12 bars, okay? So who remembers this from the chapter? How, how, how would I get, what's a good way to get started automating this? We know where we are in the chapter. Do you guys have your books with you? If I give you a page number, is that helpful or no? Some of you. Yeah, 79 is where automation is. Yeah, so we could actually just record it or what I'm interested in is this control clicking, okay? So if I control click on the frequency, 
you see that my first option here, let me zoom in so it's not so grainy on your screens, okay? That says show automation. So I control clicked on the frequency, show automation, okay? It's now gonna give me a clip view. This is my 12 bars that I'm progressing through. And you see that dotted line? That's the frequency setting, okay? It's straight across because it's stable right now. I would like it to not be stable. I would like it to change over the course of my 12 bars. So what I can do, much like other programs, uh, you may have seen similar, right, similar interfaces in Logic and in Pro Tools, right? You can click and move, let's see. And this is where live is a little bit different. I can't, I don't double click to add a point and then drag it. I have to click and drag. So the interface is a little bit different. That's why I want to make sure you guys know how to use this, okay? So again, I everybody got to this? How do you get Okay, so if I, if you, in here, if you control click on the frequency knob itself, control click on the frequency knob and show automation, that will take you to automation for the clip, okay? trying to be very specific in my words here. This is automation that is specific to this clip. In other words, as the clip loops over and over again, the automation loops over and over again. Okay? You can click and add points and create a shape here. So go ahead and practice this. Make sure you understand how it works because I think the clicking is a little bit different than it is in Logic, at least how I remember it. I remember in Logic you had to click to add a point and then you could click to drag it, right? Here you just click and drag immediately, adds a point and moves it, okay? So the interface is a little bit different using the mouse here. You should now hear it get darker and then brighter. Okay. Ooh, that's, unless you want that to happen. Yeah, so that that's an interesting. Okay. There must be a way to do that. Shift. Draw mode. Ooh, draw mode sounds interesting. So, were you able to move just one point? Ah, okay, there we go. So I, I had to click in the uh, gray space and then I could click an in individual line. So clicking in the gray space deselects the line and now I can grab individual points. Okay. I can't click and drag and okay Am I able to create an automation line for the clip? Okay. And you can easily repeat this process for every knob in your clip, okay? So every knob, I mean if I want to go back in here and I want to automate the LFO rate, I just simply control click on it, show the automation, and I get a new automation line that's for that specific knob, okay? So every piece of your signal chain, from instrument to effects to what have you, everything that's happening on the track, you can automate each each item individually over the course of the clip. Yeah. Question, Hunter? Yeah. And this basically just automatically breaks the down. Yep. Is there a way to know exactly how much that is by like, you make the points and then you put them up and down, but is there actually a way to see how much it actually turns it up versus just having to Yeah, if you, if you look on here, it will say, there's a little float. Yeah, you see a little float in there? It's telling me that's 2.09 kilohertz. Uh, this one down here is 118 hertz. So, so it's giving you an update as far as what the value is at that point. Okay. But you're bounded by the top and the bottom. The top and the bottom are your maximum and your minimum, okay? Okay, 
So that's clip automation, okay? Um, now, I've got other layers for my 12 bar blues that I can add in here, okay? But if you try to add them in, you might run into a little bit of a problem uh, because by default, right, we're at the one bar quantize mark, okay? And I'm gonna add in the metronome just to, because you know, I, my timing is bad and I need the metronome to keep myself in time, right, okay? 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 But if I go to start cueing these clips, watch what happens. Now this one is a couple bars behind. Now this one is a couple bars behind. And then my pedal point. Okay. What's the problem with this when I have a 16 bar loop? <laughs> or 12, excuse me, yeah, 12 bar loop. Excuse me, thank you. Okay. <laughs> If I've got 12 bar loops that have a chord change that they need to stay in time with each other, right? Now, my different 12 bar blues are, are moving at different rates. They're not in sync with each other, right? Okay. So that's why I wanted to bring you back to this quantize menu that was mentioned uh, at our workshop, okay? You notice that the highest number here is eight, okay? That basically means that it's gonna wait for the eight bar mark before queuing in, okay? But you need, probably, I, I think, Eight bars might be better, or four bars might be better. I'm trying to think. Something that's going to give me more... Let's see. It's not going to jump in the next bar. It's going to wait four bars before jumping in, okay? And four is at least a, a smaller... Uh, or, see, a bigger division of the 12 bars than one, right? Okay? I, I'm, I'm more likely to be one-third off rather than one-twelfth off, okay? Which leads to problems, okay? So that's one way I can tackle it so I can trigger with more regularity across four bars, okay? And you might, I'm going to go ahead and stop this for a second. Um, you might need to mess with the quantize if you've got longer loops, longer chord changes in your clips, okay? The other way to tackle this would be through grouping, okay? Which is mentioned in your chapter, chapter explicit, explicitly, okay? I can actually take these four tracks, okay? And you can follow along here. If you click on one, then shift click, shift click, shift click, okay? See how they're not all highlighted together? Okay? Uh, if you're a mousing person, you can control click and there should be an option to group these tracks or there's also a keystroke, which is command G to group these tracks. And what just happened visually there? Let's see. Everybody see that? So I've got this kind of, I don't know, it, it created a new column called group, right? And then it gave me a little visual over the top of the four tracks to show me that this is what's grouped in, okay? The nice thing about this grouping is you actually get a trigger point for the entire group over here. So if you want to make sure they all change at the same time, if I, if I now, let's see, stop this, hit play. going to wait four bars because I set it to four bars quantized, but now see how they all start at the same time? Now I don't have to worry about them being out of sync with each other because I had to click four clips all at the same time. I can trigger all four of these layers, all four of these clicks at the clips at the same time, and if I want to change keys at the next 12 bars, all I have to do is click here. Okay, now I've changed keys on my 12 bar blues pattern. Make sense? Everybody see the usefulness of that? Okay, when you need things locked in together, okay? I can still change them individually, and if I get to the end of my 12 bars and I, for some reason, want the fuzz pad to switch back to F so that it's playing in a different key and the buzz to play in E, it'll happily let me do that, okay? So it sounds a little chaotic there because I've got three different keys going on at the same time. But at least the pedal points are all are both in the same key. But if I want to lock back in, 
Okay? Make sense? So it doesn't eliminate your ability to move between different layers in the individual tracks, different clips, but it does give you the capability of triggering all everything in the row all at the same time, which is extremely useful. Yes? Okay. How am I doing on time? Ooh, wow. Okay. Um, we've got this group of four now, okay? So I can go through and I can add a filter to each one of these tracks, okay? And effectively do this on each one of the tracks, right? Remember I'm talking about inlining, okay? But I can also, on the group, add a track which is inline for every element on the track, every element in the group, okay? Effectively, it mixes everything together and then applies the effect to that, okay? This could be a very useful place to add an EQ, right? So let's do that. I'm gonna flip back over to live. On my group now, you notice I have an effects audio chain here, okay? And I can scroll down to EQ8, click and drag, and now I've got an EQ that's for the entire group, okay? All of the tracks get mixed together and then go through this EQ. So if I want to play my 12 bar blue patter pattern now and I want to do a bass boost, I can do that because I want some strong bass coming out of my... That's even distorting now, but you know. And I want to dampen the highs maybe. Okay. And an EQ is nothing more than a series of filters, okay? that are controlling the over and shaping the overall frequency spectrum, okay? But the, the point I want to get across here is that when you group tracks together, you can then add an effect to everything together in the group. It mixes all the outputs together and then sends it to whatever effects are on the group. Make sense? <clears throat> Any questions about that? Okay. Now the question I had at this point when I was stepping through this demo working on this is what happens if I automate now the effect on the group, right? Because what if I want my bass boost to uh, you know increase over time here? Let's see here. Click this one. I'm going to control click. No commands available. Let's see here. This one. Can I automation this? Notice that, so let me cl clip back here. So I don't want to gloss over that. If you go to this frequency knob, if you followed along and did the EQ8, right? And you control click on it, this is now automation on the group, right? It's the effect that's on the group. When I try to show automation here, I'm gonna get the arrangement view, not the clip view. I get the arrangement view, not the clip view, okay? That's because once we go to the group level, we can only automate over the course of the track, not within the clip, okay? Say that one more time. On the group, I can only automate for the track over time, over the entire arrangement. I can't automate within the confines of my clip so that it loops over and over again. Make sense? I, I then, I'm forced to do it over the course of my arrangement. I can still automate. Okay. And if I now jump back here, there's my cursor. So it's automating over time. Lovely. I'm not sure that's what I wanted, but okay. See how it's moving. Okay. But that pattern is not going to repeat anymore because it's at the group level, not the clip level. Make sense? So there's a, I mean, that to me is a key difference and make sure you've got that separated in your mind. That if you're trying to automate something in a loop, you need to do it on a clip. If you want to automate something over the course of your song, over your piece, then it's, then you work in the arrangement view with the, the automation at this level and it's just going to keep persisting on, okay? I'll let the chord changes finish and then I'll stop it real quick. Okay, so I've stopped that. Um, ba, 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 ba. So I did that, I did that, I did that. 
reverb, send and receive, okay? Because I've flashed this up here a couple times, and is, is this still fuzzy to some of you in terms of what we mean by sidechain processing, what we mean by a send and receive track? Some of you are shaking your head no. Some of you are okay with that. How would I do that in this session? You should see a receive track in this session, yes? So in this session, if you go back to session view, we see this A reverb over here. Okay, if you click on that track, that's a receive for my send, okay? And I've got a reverb set up there, okay? It's just a default reverb doing a default reverb thing, okay? Um, I can change, let's see, reflections, diffusion, decay time, 3.6 seconds. That's, that's on the order of like, an, uh, like a Lee Chapel kind of reverb, okay? 3.6 seconds. It's a bit longer than that. Okay, let's turn it up then. Okay, we'll go to, we'll go to, um, you know, eight point, uh, nine point three. That looks good. Okay, so that reverb's turned up. Okay, so now if I want to send signal to this reverb, okay, because by default when I play, nothing's going over to this reverb track. Everybody see how the level meters are not moving? There's no sound coming out. That's where these sends come into play. Okay. We send a little bit of our pedal over to the reverb, and it now should sound. That's probably hard to hear. I'm going to go with the. Uh... There they are. I'm going to turn down my. Can we hear the reverb on there? Okay, so what happens is this send now goes over to the reverb, the reverb processes it, adds the reverb effect, and the reason for doing this would be one of uh, a couple different things. One, you get kind of a more cohesive reverb sound, but two is you save CPU, especially with some of the more uh, processor intensive reverbs that are out there, okay? By doing it once on all of the sounds in a mix, you save your CPU processing, okay? So the idea is you can send, use that to turn up the send, okay, send information over that. This now becomes your dry signal, so if I want to hear just, oh, looks like it's pre, it's post, there we go. I don't want to gloss over that, right in here, and I know I'm at time, so if you need to pack up. This pre and post is pre and post fader on the track. Okay, when it's in pre, the send and the gain will act independent of one another. So you can actually control wet sound versus dry sound. Okay, when it's post, it actually takes the level after the gain slider before sending it. Okay, so your gain slider will affect both the, the wet level and the dry level. Okay, so if you want independent dry and wet, pre is the setting you want here for your sends. Okay. So that's what I'm talking about here. Your effect is over there on that, that reverb channel. You're sending the level over here and processing it. You get the wet sound. The gain then gives you the dry signal, OK? OK. Did this help you understand the effects processing, effects routing in live? Yes. I know some of you have class, so go ahead and jet. Just as we end up tomorrow's values day, don't forget no classes tomorrow, values day. Please attend some of the values day events. And there is a reading for uh, Wednesday as well, so make sure you're doing that. It's another Max tutorial, so you might want to make plans to be in front of a computer running Max to do those tutorials, okay? I'll see you all Wednesday.